Good Friday evening to you. Hope your weekend is off to a great start. Welcome to More Sports and Less Levine, the weekend winner's edition. I'm Dave Bacon. Browns on a bye. Buckeyes getting ready to play tonight. That's right, a Friday night game against Northwestern. Let's welcome in uh, Doug LaMaurice, uh, the columnist from Cleveland.com, follows the Buckeyes very closely. Uh, Doug, Friday night's uh, college football, Big Ten college football with the Buckeyes just doesn't quite seem right. What do you make of it? What are your thoughts on the Friday night games? Uh, it's not something that you'd want to do on a regular basis at all with a program like Ohio State. I understand why some of the lower tier Big Ten programs do it, try to get some exposure. Uh, TV is king. We know that this is an exception to the rule. Ohio State's not going to do it at home. Um, Northwestern isn't even thrilled about doing this on a Friday night. Uh, they have some logistical issues um, that are that are going to be a problem just with parking and that kind of thing at Northwestern. I don't think it's that big a deal. I know I know people are upset about it, and if it was any kind of regular thing, but they, they announced this a couple years ago that the Big Ten was going to do some Friday night stuff. And this is really the first time that Ohio State's been involved with it. So if it's once every few years, you know, there's a lot of other things that have gotten screwy in major college football because of money. Um, this is the latest thing. But as a rare exception, I, I think it's OK. The other thing I would say is, you know, a, a program like in a conference like the Big Ten doesn't really need the exposure. I, I, I get why some of the. The mid-majors and that do it midweek. But the Big Ten and, and you know, the, the, the thing that has to be of a concern for major college football, for the Power Fives, what if the NFL decides, you know what, we're going to put a couple of games on Saturday throughout our entire schedule because we need more of that TV pie. I mean, that would be tantamount to what playing on Friday night is for the high school. Yeah, I, I, in some ways – it would be the same. I mean, obviously, the, the the NFL and college football are both gazillion-dollar television industries, and high school football is not. So, again, we're on, a TV, we're on a TV show talking about how TV screws everything up. Um, I mean, it, it's a it's entertainment, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it with how people view football on a weekend. But we are so far down the road. <laughs> Yeah. TV running the world that I get it, but I mean, I don't know what to so if Ohio State did this twice a year and played on Friday, huge problem. If they even did it every year, I think it could be a problem once every few years. And the thing is, you're talking about like programs like Rutgers or Northwestern or Purdue. Maybe you understand why they do it when they do it. They want to have a good opponent because nobody wants to put Northwestern Illinois or Northwestern Purdue as much as they want to put Northwestern, who no one cares about, against somebody good. So Ohio State becomes sort of like the, the team that gets a little bit abused in this because they're the draw when they go on the road. Okay, now let's move on to the Buckeyes on the field, um, a much more pleasant topic. Um, they've looked very good. You could argue they really haven't been tested yet. What just You've seen a lot of, of Ohio State football over the years. What's your impression of this team been uh, as you've watched it? It's my 15th year covering these guys. I think they are as complete as any team I've covered. Um, obviously, the 2014 team that won the national championship uh, had talent all over the field. They took a little time to grow into that. I've always said the 2005 team, which is the first team I covered that lost to Texas at home and lost to Penn State that year, probably was as good as any team I saw. But I think when you when you combine everything that's happening with this team, which is the quarterback play, which is the depth of elite talent defensively, really good schematic coaching so far through six games on both sides of the ball. I've said all year, I feel like the greatest strength of this team is that it doesn't have an obvious weakness. And I can go back through even the best Ohio State teams I've covered and usually say, well, this team wasn't so great at this or this team wasn't so great at that. Um, it's much harder to do with with this team right now. Uh, currently ranked fourth in the in the country in most uh, most of the polls and, and those kind of things. Um, really haven't been tested yet. Is that more a testament to to how well they've played as opposed to who they've played, or or is it a little bit of both? You think? Yeah, I mean it's both. 
No, they're going to have two top 10 teams here in the second half of the season with Wisconsin and Penn State. And I think those are going to those are both good teams uh, in very different ways. So those will be real tests. Michigan remains a top 20 team, although they certainly have their flaws. Um, you know, Michigan State's a good defense. Michigan State doesn't do much offensively. Michigan State's a good defense and Ohio State almost put up 600 yards on them. Um, Cincinnati has looked pretty good since getting its doors blown off in Ohio Stadium. Um, so part of it is that, yeah, Ohio State's actually played a couple of teams that are okay and made them look terrible. But certainly um, the, the, the issue a lot of times is when you're trying to talk about Big Ten teams in a national perspective is, is their schedule going to be good enough for them to get the respect they deserve? And I do think with the Wisconsin and Penn State tests coming up, with the way those two teams have played, if Ohio State wins out and beats those teams, Ohio State certainly will get that respect. But part of their problem now is they're just so good. They're making their opponents look bad, even when those opponents aren't as aren't such terrible teams. Well, and, uh, you know, we were a little concerned because you, you weren't exactly sure what you were going to get at quarterback with Justin Fields. You've got a pretty good quarterback there who's put himself, I think, right in the middle of that Heisman race if he continues to play the way he has. His raw stats don't stack up with, with some of the other guys, like former Ohio State quarterback Joe Burrow, who's lighting it up at LSU, and Tua tonga and Jalen Hurts and some of those guys. But, I mean, he's done everything they've asked, right? So uh, J.K. Dobbins has run the ball really well. The defense has been really good. But Justin Fields has been, I feel like, in, in total control almost of every single game, of almost every single snap. Uh, he is dynamic. He can make big throws. He's made as many big-time throws. Statistically, they measure that kind of stuff. He's made as many big-time throws as basically any quarterback in the country. They just maybe aren't trying that as much. They haven't run him all that often because they don't need to. They save it for the red zone. They get banged for the buck. When he runs, he's dynamic. So uh, I've been impressed most with the way that he has been seemingly in control of snap to snap, that he's been very steady. He's been very accurate with the ball. He can get out of the pocket and do some really athletic things. But he's looked like a guy who's certainly, I feel like, been a, he looks like he started for more than a year. And actually, he just got on campus in January. Uh, what about some of the things that uh, impress you that maybe are flying under the radar a, a little bit for, uh, for most folks? What, what about this team has really kind of, you know, opened your eyes and said, well, you know, that's, that's pretty good. I think the offensive line has played well. Um, that's four out of five new starters for this season on that offensive line, but they have a lot of highly recruited guys on there. They have a graduate transfer from Rutgers who has played before. Um, I, I think they have been dominant at times, especially in their run blocking. And so, um, again, it's not a shock when you have guys who are national top 50 recruits like Wyatt Davis and Josh Myers doing that, but they're first time starters. And then the secondary, you know, Jeff Okuda is a guy at corner who is being looked at as a potential top 10, maybe top five NFL draft pick. Everybody knows he's great. But I think that whole secondary has played very well. Sean Wade has played well. Damon Arnett has played well. Again, part of the issue in the Big Ten right now is not just this year, but almost every year, the, the Big Ten doesn't have elite quarterbacks. They don't have guys that test you week after week. Um, even when Wisconsin and Penn State play Ohio State, that's not what those teams do best. So, if Ohio State makes the playoff and they run into Jalen Hurts or Tua tonga Bailoa or Trevor Lawrence or Joe Burrow or a guy or Jake Fromm or a guy like that, then we're going to see. But for now, um, this pass defense is really, really hard to throw on for anybody in this conference. The other thing that uh, I'll ask you, kind of wrapping up our thoughts about Ohio State, how impressed are you? And you touched on it a little bit, just the way this defense has played. It it was a little bit of a mess last year, and and it's been really, really solid, bordering on very good uh, so far this year. Yeah, nine starters back. Um, again, a lot of highly recruited guys in there, and it sort of makes your shit make you shake your head more about what those former defensive coaches were doing last year to sort of get these guys to look like they couldn't play defense when now they're letting them play. We've talked about it a million times. They're they're just letting them, they simplified it a little bit. The guys have more confidence, but. Again, I've done this for 15 years. I think Chase Young is is probably the best defensive end I've covered here, and that includes two Boses and Vernon Golston and a bunch of guys who were drafted in the top 10. I think Jeff Okuda might be the best cornerback I've covered here. That includes Marshawn Lattimore and Denzel Ward and, and Bradley Roby and, and first-round guys. They have some really high-end guys, and the scheme is letting them show how good they are. 
Doug Lamarice, we appreciate it. Stick around. Uh, Doug and I are going to talk a little bit about the Cleveland Browns. Uh, we got to take a quick time out, and we want to tell you uh, our stat of the month for the Ohio Lottery. Did you know there is over $6.25 million paid out on Ohio Lottery pick games each and every week? With that amount of winning, what's stopping you? Stop by your local retailer. Try your luck with pick three, pick four, and pick five. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. When we return, Doug Maurice will join us again. We'll talk Browns. Browns on a bye. They will play the Patriots coming back from the bye. More sports. Les Levine, Weekend Winners Edition. We'll be right back. Downtown Casino now has sports betting. Use one of the 50 state-of-the-art Bet America kiosks to place your bet. Then watch your favorite games on our new HD televisions or visit our new sportsbook area only at Presque Isle Downtown Casino. Lottery Partners in Education program recognizes role model students and teachers from across Ohio. Nominations can now be done completely online. To nominate a deserving teacher or student, go to ohiolottery.com. In the About section, find Partners in Education. There you will find links to the nomination forms. Students kindergarten through 12th grade can be academic all-stars. Teachers can be honored as a Teacher of the Month. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education, where stars shine. Welcome back to more sports and Les Levine, the weekend winners edition. I'm Dave Bacon and uh, the Browns with a bye. Uh, they head into the bye week two and four, uh, lost at home against Seattle last time out. Uh, now they have a, an entire uh, week off and then they get ready for the New England Patriots who uh, play Monday night. Let's welcome back in Doug Maurice, columnist from Cleveland.com. And Doug, two and four is concerning. How concerned are you? And, and how much of a head scratcher is the way, uh, particularly this offense is played? I am pretty low on the list of concerned people, I think, because I feel like there are some people who are freaking out and want to make drastic moves. Um, there are some people who are saying, like, this is the same old Browns. And I certainly thought they'd be better than this. I mean, I picked them to go 12 and 4, and I, and I don't think they're going to go 10 and 0 the rest of the way and make my prediction correct. But you know, they had a terrible first game against the Titans and got got eliminated from that game by themselves, by their penalty. And then they went to the West Coast and played a terrible game on a Monday night on a long road trip against their, a really uh, well-coached San Francisco team. But the other two losses at home against the Rams and the Seahawks, you know, they were right there. And they, they made mistakes when they couldn't make mistakes. A mistake here, a mistake there. They were right in those games. So, you know, I... They probably should be three and three. They should have won one of those two. The schedule gets a lot easier. Um, Freddie Kitchens, I think, has made mistakes, but I don't think he's been as bad as some people think he has been. Baker Mayfield has made mistakes. I don't think he's been as bad as some people think he has been. I think they should and and might improve the offensive line, but but I think they're they're kind of close. And so, like, I'm sure there are people screaming at the the screen right now, disagreeing with me, but this team has talent we know that and sometimes you lose I don't know what to tell you sometimes you lose and I feel like nine and seven or eight and eight still could very well win this division and I think this team absolutely could still go nine and seven or eight and eight maybe even ten and six so I don't know kind of chill about it <laughs> um 
You mentioned the line, and Baker Mayfield hasn't played as well as as uh, a lot of people might have thought that uh, that he would. Everybody was concerned about how you're going to replace the right guard. The tackles have kind of been a question mark too. How how much do you think the line has played into what Baker Mayfield's problems have been? I think it's a lot, and and again, you can look at statistics that'll show you. Well, you know they're. They're blocking it. They're actually, you know, a top 15 offensive line, or you can go through PFF stats and all those things are important. I get that. I just think Baker does at times have a tendency to leave clean pockets and to get a little antsy in the pocket. And I think that tendency is exacerbated when he doesn't necessarily believe in his line. And so I think Greg Robinson at left tackle and Chris Hubbard at right tackle Again, you can look at them statistically and, and by the numbers. I think they'll do their job, you know, three or four times in a row. But it feels like they have killed drives with inopportune penalties. They have killed drives, allowing a sack that can't be allowed. Um, and I think if you fix part of that, it very well may happen that Baker Mayfield and Freddie Kitchens, A, get better at their jobs and B, look better at their jobs because I think maybe both of them don't have full trust in that line right now. And if you could give the quarterback and the coach something more to believe in, I think everything might look a lot smoother. Yeah, I would agree that the, the thing that in just watching it, it's never, there's no area in that pocket that he feels he can consistently escape from or go to, which makes it look like he's just running around aimlessly trying to buy time. And I, you know, they talk about his mechanics and, and I think all of those are a function of there isn't an area that he can get to where he can feel like he can get and buy time and, and have time to throw the football. It's, it's always coming yeah. from a different area. I don't think he's dropping back and feeling comfortable. He's not confident when he takes that snap and, and sits in that pocket. And there's a lot of other things there. I mean, there's been some timing issues with the receivers. Um, Freddie at times has not put him in the best position. I actually thought that, he looked pretty good against Seattle. I thought he threw with more anticipation. I thought a couple of throws they missed was because maybe receivers have not been anticipating his anticipation, but I thought Baker threw on time a little more often. But again, you can go back through there and find the Greg Robinson hold um, right before the final pick to Dontrell Hilliard. There was a play where Baker escaped and hit Odell Beckham on the sideline, to set up a third and one that was negated by a Chris Hubbard hold. And it all of a sudden was second and 21. Again, I get it. Offensive linemen have penalties sometimes. But there are just times where if you get a, a, the wrong penalty at the wrong time, a drive can be over. And that has happened to them sometimes. They barely punted against Seattle. They barely punted. They moved the ball up and down the field and had some bad tip balls that, that turned into interceptions. But I feel like this offense can move the ball. And so... If you get a little more belief in the line, maybe by making a change there, and you have guys stop dropping balls, it can look a lot better. You keep hearing the name Trent Williams, uh, left tackle, sitting out. Redskins have repeatedly said they're not going to trade him. It, it seems to be a personal thing between Williams and Washington and Washington's medical staff. What would you be willing to give the Washington Redskins to get uh, a left tackle who is a multi multi-time all pro. It is a hard balance. And I asked John Dorsey about that balance this week. There are salary cap considerations looking ahead when you've guys like Joe Schobert and JC Treader and Rashard Higgins and Demarius Randall who need to get paid. And now you're going to throw Trent Williams into that mix. You already traded your first round pick this year to get Odell Beckham. So do you want to trade another first round pick down the line to get another older guy? On the other hand, we've talked a million times when you have a quarterback on a rookie contract, this is your time to win. I think it's possible that Trent Williams would fix a lot of this. I know a lot of people say he's not the, that wouldn't fix it. Baker is not reading the field. Baker, I think Trent Williams might make Baker a lot more comfortable. And if you put Trent Williams at left tackle, maybe you move Greg Robinson to right tackle. Maybe you move Chris Hubbard to right guard. I don't know. I think you could start fixing multiple positions on that offensive line. So. The weird part of this is, like, David Njoku has been hurt. That's a talented guy. I don't think they've missed I don't think they've missed David Njoku. If you want to include him in a trade, I think I'd be okay with that. Greedy Williams and Denzel Ward have been hurt. I think they have missed them at times at the end of games. But you've also shown you have some depth at corner with Terrence Mitchell and TJ Carey and those guys. 
if you want to peel somebody out of that group to trade him for Trent Williams, I think I might be okay with that. Because do you want to trade either Higgins or Callaway? Higgins didn't get on the field last week. So if you trade your fourth best receiver, I'd trade Callaway before I'd trade Higgins. But if you trade your fourth best receiver and he's a piece in a deal to fix a hole, there's a hole on this offensive line. You have depth elsewhere. I think maybe there's some young pieces you can include. There was a time when I would not have traded for Trent Williams. But I think it's possible one move can fix about five things with this offense. So I might really look at it. And the, you know, again, the thing that we keep hearing nationally is it's really gotten personal between the Redskins and Williams, and they've they've held fast that they're not going to trade them. The other thing is, is as that trade deadline closes in closer and closer, they're in full re, you know, rebuild mode because they fired their coach. You know, they're they haven't played Dwayne Haskins yet, being the Redskins. As that gets closer, the more you tempt them with some young talent, the more they may be like likely to listen. Would you trade the the Browns' first round pick for him if they if the Redskins said we got to have that first round pick? That's why I'm not the GM, man. I just <laughs> I just I take hot shots from my basement. I don't know. I would <laughs> I would I would think about it now. Here's the thing, and, I, and I've criticized John Dorsey the last couple of days for some things. The Austin Corbett pick was a huge mix, miss. What's happening with the offensive line? It does seem like, I think John Dorsey made Dave Gettleman make a trade that he kind of didn't want to make, actually. And he sort of like got that Odell Beckham trade done. And maybe in hindsight, Dave Gettleman would say like, what did I do? I think it's possible John Dorsey is the kind of guy who could go into that Washington situation. And they don't actually want to trade Trent Williams. They want to hold strong. And Dorsey just has that kind of personality who's like, come on, come on, let's do this, come on. And actually, you know, makes it work out. When you look at what they gave up for Odell Beckham, you start, you know, Peppers in a first round pick. Are you going to give up more than that for Trent Williams? Like that would be hard to do in my opinion, but maybe Dorsey, you know, he's got that way about him. Maybe he can get that price down a little bit. I could go either way. I, I on some level, would trust John Dorsey to realize what needs to be done in the moment. I wouldn't be thrilled about trading a first round pick, but if he could explain why it had to happen, I think I might buy it. Uh, last thing I'll ask you, as you look forward, what do you think needs to get fixed for the Browns to get where everybody, you and I both thought they would be um, at the end of the year? Is there a one or what one or two things do you think need to be solid as they move forward and get out of this bye week and start facing the Patriots and then, a much easier back half of the schedule. I think a, a lot of, well, the one thing is the defense gave up a couple crucial drives against Seattle that killed them. I mean, again, for all the things that went crazy near the end zone when the Browns were on offense and they threw the challenge flag and all that, and people are giving Freddie a hard time about that, they did end up taking the lead then. And then the defense let the Seahawks march right down the field and score the go-ahead touchdown. So at some point, this defense, with the talent it has, has to get critical stops. And I feel like too often, that defense has it. That's easy to say, hard to do. They need You need to lean on them when you can. Offensively, I think the red zone play calling and getting the ball to the right people in the red zone has not been great. Odell has not been involved enough in the red zone. It's like, oh, Antonio Callaway dropped the ball at the goal line. Well, why were you throwing it to him? <laughs> throw it to someone better. They throw it to Demetrius Harris a lot in the end zone. Throw it to somebody else. I get it. Defenses are taking the guys away. I think the red zone play calling could improve, but I think the communication with the receivers, I feel like Baker and the receivers are a little bit off. I think sometimes Baker's put the ball where he thinks the receiver's going to be, and it makes Baker look like he's inaccurate, but I think Baker might be throwing it exactly where he wants to throw it, but there's some timing off, there's some communication off of, hey, I'm trying to put this on your back shoulder or put it away from the defense, you're continuing through the route. I think some of that precision with the receivers, I don't think Baker Mayfield just forgot how to throw. I think he and his guys are not there yet, and maybe they can get there in the next couple of weeks. Doug LaMarie says, always appreciate the insight and the time. Columnist for Cleveland.com, Doug LaMarie. So we're going to step aside and uh, take a time out. But before we go, I want to tell you about Northeast Factory Direct. No gimmicks, no deceiving blowout sales or typical retail nonsense. Just three huge bare bones warehouses filled with some of the same stuff found at a number of stores. One big difference, at Northeast Factory Direct, the items are priced about half of regular retail. If you want nice big ticket items to improve your home and you want to pay half the price most people pay, 
Head to Northeast Factory Direct, three locations, West 140th in Cleveland, in the old B&B Appliance on Lakeland Boulevard in Euclid and Freeway Drive in Macedonia. You can check out everything on northeastfactorydirect.com. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. When we return, we'll hear from John Dorsey, who met with the media and a couple of the Browns players. More sports and Les Levine. The weekend winner's edition will be right back. No other company or product can match the features, benefits, and warranty of an authentic Nature Stone floor. There was moisture in the basement. It ruined the carpeting. The smell was terrible. We didn't feel safe in our own basement, and that's when we called Nature Stone. And with Russell's promise, our true unconditional warranty, you will never have to replace your basement flooring again. Get Nature Stone installed by the end of October and save up to half off. Schedule your free cost estimate easily online today at naturestone.com. It's not just a floor, wow, it's Nature Stone. Oh, gosh, <laughs> playing Ohio Lottery Pick 3, I see. <laughs> uh, what are you gonna do, uh, a box bed, a split pairs, or a wheel? Uh. Well, old Picky Ricky here's a straight shooter. <laughs> okay. It razzes my berries when newbies think betting's hard. Straight bets are easy peasy. Just match three numbers in order and win the old fashioned way. This, on the other hand, is not so simple. Oh, God. Oh, jeez. Jeez, so weak. <laughs> Play the Ohio Lottery Pick Three today. There are tastes we remember. Every smell brings the happiness of times gone by. Experience this every time you walk into Gallucci's Italian Foods. Whether you need lunch on the go, a catered party, or that perfect blend of wine, meats, and cheeses, Gallucci's has exactly what you're looking for. Straight from Mama's Kitchen. For old world traditions or original experiences. From the tastes you remember to new flavors you'll never forget. Gallucci's is a tasty branch of your family tree. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just a mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. Welcome back to more sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition. I'm Dave Bacon. Browns have the weekend off. They are on the bye week, which means they get a little extra time to get ready for the New England Patriots. Patriots play Monday night against the Jets, so they're coming off a short week. Yeah, I know it's uh, reaching at something, but hey, Browns need any advantage they can get against New England. John Dorsey met with the media and assessed where the Browns were and also where he thinks they might be headed. Game. And the facts are we're two and four, but nobody in this organization is happy about two and four. I mean, that's, that's real. But let me remind everybody here, there's a lot of football to be played here. I mean, we have 10 games left um, in the season. I think the bye week comes at a good time. I think it gives the coaches a chance to review, self-assess, make some corrections, and implement those corrections. It gives the players a chance to regroup and then make that push on the back end of the 10-game schedule. So with that being said, the facts are what? We're 2-1 and one in the AFC. We're 1-0 in the AFC North, and we're 0-3 in the NFL, I mean the NFC. The positive here is we have five home games. We have five divisional games. There is a lot of football to be played here. Uh, I know from personal experiences that um, I've been on teams that you know, have had worse starts than this. And guess what? They've played really good at the back end of the season. So with that, I'll take your questions. John, you knew there was going to be growing pains. Um, what stands out, though? What, what should be maybe further along now after six weeks than it is? Um, I think what we have to do is probably have to be a little bit more consistent. We have to be a little bit more um, attention to detail. And I think what you do here now, for the players now have a chance in these next four days to kind of, you know, look themselves in the mirror and just say, okay, what can I do, what I haven't done in the first six games to kind of forge this thing and move this thing in a positive direction? Because there, again, I can reiterate, there's a lot of football left to be played. What is your theory on why <laughs> Baker Mayfield isn't as sharp as he was in, in the last half of last year? Well, I think I told you on the spring, to master the quarterback position is very hard. 
you just can't go up and show up and do it. I mean, there's a lot involved in this. Um, he's in his second year. And right now, defensive coordinators are probably throwing different looks that he hasn't seen. But Baker's one of those guys that, you know, he's smart enough. He's not going to make the same mistake twice. So he's learning from that. But I like where he is. I like his uh, competitiveness. I, I, love, I love everything about him. That hasn't changed for me one bit in terms of his competitiveness, his ability to throw the football uh, and move his thing. What I really like is his teammates like him. A lot about how you expect, I don't know if it's 20 or 25 percent jump from a guy ideally yeah. year one to year two. Um, have you seen, where can you point to areas where Baker has improved when most of the numbers show that he hasn't? Well, what, what, what I like is like earlier when he was rolling out to his right, and a lot of right handed quarterbacks would do that early in their age. But what I've liked is now all of a sudden through coaching, through Ryan and through Todd and through Freddie, he's starting to step up within the middle of the pocket. And that's a progression there. I think his balls are still accurate. Everybody keeps saying there's inaccuracy in his ball. I still think he throws a good football. Given the fact that uh, you know, the, the expectations of uh, the team, yourself, kind of 1-0 and in the division, very much alive in the AFC playoffs in that regard, do the coaches need to do a better job of managing the game to get wins rather than worry about developing the offense? I think, uh, I think Freddie's hired a very talented coaching staff. And I think they're exceptional teachers. I think there's really good communication on the game management standpoint that you talk about. I think there's clear communication there. Have you been unhappy about the way some situations have been managed? You know what? Right now, we're two and four. We're going to nitpick a little. Everybody's going to nitpick. But right now, we're two and four. We got a lot of football left. Do you feel like Baker? Um Every single thing that you saw in him when, when you made him the number one overall pick, all the goals and dreams and hopes that you had for him, do you still see all of that in front of him and he's still that guy? 100%. What are, what are some of those things? What are some of those reasons that make you feel that way? Um, I like his approach to the game of football. I like the game planning processes of that. I like how he goes out there and competes. I like his grit that he shows. I like how he throws the football. I like how he extends plays. And, you know, again, it, last I looked, it takes 53 guys to put this thing together. And that's, it's got to be 53 guys playing the game of football. It's made clear in the offseason not to buy into the hype, that they have to go out and do it. It's not just about talent. How do you think the team, and even the coaching staff too, has responded to the spotlight being on them, and do you think that that could be a contributing factor to uh, some of the early season struggles? No, I don't. I think there, there's got to be a degree of consistency. There's got to be a, a, a degree of attention to detail, and I think that's natural. Everybody's going to say that. Uh, these guys work really hard. The coaching staff works really hard at preparing these guys, and you know that's what it's going to take. It's going to take attention to those little details moving this thing forward. Traded Corbett the other day, and I just wonder how you felt. First of all, on the Corbett thing, and then also on the offensive line. Well, on the offensive line itself, I'll address that. Is they have to be a little more consistent in their play, and and, and that's real. With Cor uh, you know, with with Austin, you know, I'm going to do what's ever in the best interest of this organization. And, and I thought yesterday was the appropriate time. Uh, I want to wish him best, and you know the new environment will be good for him. But I'm going to do what's best for this organization. And at the time, I thought it was probably the right move to, right now. Do you have something else you could do on the line or whatever to make it uh, make it better? Yeah, I mean that's that's for coming down the road. Is it uh, linemen uh, that are good enough to start in the middle of the season? Are supplies usually limited. Is it particularly limited this year on the? It's a, hard it's a hard position. You know, you can't have enough of those bigs. I mean, you know, the foundation, I've always said, the, the foundation for the offense and the defense is very important. And you have to acquire a lot of, a lot of those pieces. And, you know, it, it's just a hard position to acquire, especially right about now if you're referring to trades. I think we're fine in a mental state. You know, we're obviously disappointed that we haven't started off um, as crisp as we wanted to. And, and the issue is, you know, we, we gave some games away that we, uh, you know, we had a chance to play better in. And that, that's simple. We just have to be more consistent. You know, you go from one week of 
not doing anything on offense the next week of playing pretty well on offense besides turnovers, which are the deciding factor in a lot of games. Um, you just got to find that consistency and and uh, be the same team week to week, and hopefully it's a good team. Joel, yesterday, uh, Freddie was pretty demonstrative in saying, hey, you know, we have all this talent here, but it doesn't matter. It's gotten us to two and four. We're playing like a group and not a team. Uh, how do you get to playing like a team and, and not a group, which is what you need to do? I think it's accountability. I think it's having pride in your work. Um, if you're accountable to yourself and your teammates when you go out there and you know exactly what you're doing on every play and you give your best each and every play, like usually good things are going to happen, you know? And and there's just been a play here or there where it's like someone hasn't been accountable and we've made, we, we've made a mistake and it, it hasn't been good. Um, and it just seems like it's not all in one play. You know, we have a play here, a play there, a play there, and it's four or five plays and you're like, well, there's three interceptions and a blocked punt and you lose the game by four points. You score 28, you have 40 yards of offense, you run the ball pretty well, you pass the ball pretty well, but you, you can't find a way to win, which is which is tough. Um, it's just coming together and doing all the little things right, you know. There has to be a pride in the way you prepare each week to go out and play. You know, a focus that I'm not going to be the one that lets the team down. And as everybody takes that step and keeps growing as a group and doesn't want to let the guy next to him down, then I think we'll grow more as a team. Joe, along those lines, uh, Baker was clearly fighting for an injury on Sunday. What does it mean to have your one of your leaders, teammate like that, kind of fight the lower lip and stick it out? Oh, he's tough, man. He uh, he doesn't want to come out of the game, you know, and that's uh, a credit to him as a player, as a person, as a leader. Um, just who he is, you know what I mean? And you knew that before that. You don't need to see him toughen it out. Obviously, if, if you can't do it, like, don't be out there. But he thought he could play, and he was fighting through it. And um, I give him all the credit. You know, I know that was – he took a weird hit, and he just uh, – he just keeps fighting for us. And, um, you know, he's had some bad luck on some of the throws this year and stuff. But he keeps going out there, and he keeps uh, trying to will us to victory. Yeah, obviously not what we want to be after six. Um, but I think we've identified problems we need to correct. And everything's achievable. And looking ahead, we still have five division games to play. AFC North uh, championship still attainable um, and realistic. So that's what we're shooting for. And if you do that, you get in the playoffs. That's where we want to be. Joe, what have you seen from Mac Wilson in these last four games, and where has he gotten? Yeah, I mean Mac, as every rookie is coming in, your head swimming and. Uh, in the NFL the first time, but as you get more experience, you start to settle down a little bit more. You start to trust yourself, make some plays, and I think you definitely see that with Mac. Would it be even more satisfying after this slow start to end up uh, achieving what you wanted? I mean, yeah, obviously overcoming adversity always makes uh, everything a little more sweet in the end. So um, if we're able to do that, I mean, last year there's a bunch of playoff teams that started 3-3, three and 1-5, three, and five of the Colts. So there's definitely teams There's definitely been happened before, and... I mean, make it to the end after overcoming something and make it make it better. Do you think in terms of, you know, we got four now, we can only afford three more? Or, yeah. No, not really. I just worry about the next game in front of you. You just got to win the next one, and then you can't worry about too much stuff in advance. Um, if you overlook a team that you should beat or if you overlook a game that you you think you, you got, it's the NFL, people make you pay. So you just got to take one at a time and keep stacking blocks. How do you, I know you probably don't pay attention to what's going on the fans for all panic stricken. I mean, how do you just dial that out? I mean, yeah, well, for me, I just you can't pay attention to it because if you do and you start putting that into your psyche and you're uh, if you, you let that outside noise creep in, you're gonna affect how you play on the field. So, and we got to worry about what we're doing. I just worry about my job and in the building, take my coaching points, try to get better at that. And can't worry about somebody outside the building saying, I got to do something better or do this, or do that because they don't know what's going on. So, Joe, have you taken note of the number of big-name players being traded this year? What do you make? Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously it's a shifting landscape. I feel like that's all sports in the past five years or so. There's been every league, basketball, soccer, baseball, there's been blockbuster moves here and there that surprise everybody. It's just the way it is. It's the business aspect of it. And I mean, I don't know. No comment on past that. It doesn't, doesn't affect me very much it does feel like unless I got traded. It doesn't feel like Joe Schobert, Browns linebacker, Browns with a bye, getting ready to play the Patriots uh, a week from Sunday. I want to tell you about Cuyahoga Community College. Explore your interests, find a program that puts you on a path to a bright future. Tri-C offers more than 1,000 courses and over 140 career and technical programs. Go to tri-c.edu. That's tri-c.edu. 
to find out more. We're going to step aside, take a time out when we return for entertainment purposes only. Uh, a look at some of the point spreads for this weekend's games. More sports and less Levine. The weekend winner's edition will be right back. As a kid growing up, my dream was to go to college, play baseball, and get a degree. Coming out of high school, I had two choices. I was accepted into a four-year university, but I decided to come to Tri-C after receiving a scholarship. I got my associate's degree at Tri-C. They transferred all my credits straight into Baldwin Wallace, so I started at Baldwin Wallace University as a junior. My name is Tyler Leonard, and I earned my first degree at Tri-C. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program recognizes role model students and teachers from across Ohio. Nominations can now be done completely online. To nominate a deserving teacher or student, go to ohiolottery.com. In the About section, find Partners in Education. There you will find links to the nomination forms. Students, kindergarten through 12th grade, can be academic all-stars. Teachers can be honored as a Teacher of the Month. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education, where stars shine. It takes attention to detail. With your local Bryant dealer, you're getting more than just a technician. You're getting someone who pays attention to your needs and the little things that make a big difference. It takes a dealer you can rely on. And to keep your family cool this summer, let me show you how this works. It takes Bryant. Bryant. Whatever it takes. And to keep your family comfortable, it takes Smiley One Heating and Cooling. Find them at 440-449-HEAT. Welcome back to more sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Want to remind you, legalized sports wagering a little over an hour away from downtown Cleveland in Erie, Pennsylvania at Presque Isles. Down in Casino, the Bet America Sportsbook 50 state-of-the-art kiosks. It's right off of I-90, literally. You can see it from I-90, Presque Isle, down to Casino, the Bet America Sportsbook. Let's welcome in the D-Man, Dennis Maniloff. Uh, D-Man, appreciate the time. Let's begin your alma mater tonight, hosting the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, Buckeyes, a 27-and-a-half point favorite. Who do you like in this one? Well, of course I like the Buckeyes to win outright, but that's too many points to give uh, Pat Fitzgerald team, in my opinion, even as bad as... The Buck, or excuse me, as the Wildcats have looked this year, that's just a few too many. So I, I would take Northwestern plus the points. So I have the grass nice and high for that one, and they've had time to rest. Fitzgerald will have a few uh, tricks up his sleeve. So Ohio State wins outright, but not by uh, twenty-seven and a half. We'll move on to um, NFL action. Uh, Browns obviously on a bye this week, so. Let's take a look. Uh, we got the Giants at home giving three to Arizona. Who do you like in this one? I like the Giants uh, laying the three. Uh, you know, they I thought they acquitted themselves okay against New England in Foxborough, even though it was a 21-point game. Um, I like what I'm seeing from Daniel Jones in bits and pieces. Saquon Barkley's status up in the air, even if – he doesn't play. I'm, I'm assuming that he won't uh, for this game. It, it's kind of a 50-50 deal. But even if he doesn't, I like the Giants at home primarily because of Daniel Jones's progress, but also uh, the Arizona Cardinals coming east, having to play in the tricky weather at MetLife Stadium. And, um, you know, the Cardinals are young and they're building and yeah, they've won a couple of games, but, um, I still, I still think it's going to be difficult for them to travel all the way East and, uh, at this stage in their development, try to topple the giants. We'll, uh, go to the AFC North Cincinnati, uh, hosting Jacksonville, the Jaguars, a three and a half point favorite on the road against the Bengals. And they traded away one of their best players in Jalen Ramsey to the Rams earlier this week. Who do you like? I still like the Jaguars, uh, you know, be, uh, laying the points because they're such a better team. I mean, they're a better team, even without Jalen Ramsey. 
top to bottom, that roster is so much preferable to the Cincinnati Bengals, especially a Bengals team that's banged up. And we're learning about the injuries in their secondary this week that might keep their starting cornerbacks out or at the very least uh, hobbled. So I think Gardner Minshew, the second, is going to have opportunities. Um, but I'm primarily making this pick because I think Jacksonville's defense will, uh, you know, dictate the terms to the Cincinnati offense. And I, I just think Jacksonville is, I would say, a touchdown better than Cincinnati, no matter where they play. We'll move on. And uh, another road favorite, the uh, 49ers, who have looked pretty good. Uh, we saw the beatdown they put on the Browns on Monday night a couple weeks ago. They are on the road against the Redskins, who who won the awful bowl last week, uh, defeating Miami. Who do you like in this one? Uh, 49ers, a nine-and-a-half-point favorite uh, on the road against the Redskins. Yeah, you caught me at a time. I was back and forth for a while on this, and now I am – going with the and 49ers laying the points primarily because I did a lot of research before this hit and for my published picks as well about Kyle Shanahan uh, going back to Washington. He didn't have very flattering things to say about his time there when he was the OC. Uh, you get the feeling that he really didn't like working for Daniel Snyder. So Kyle Shanahan or primarily he didn't like the fact the way his dad was treated. So this is Kyle Shanahan's uh, opportunity to stick it to the uh, Redskins. And I don't think he's going to pass on that opportunity. He will, uh, he will try to run up the score if he can. So that's where I'm getting it from. Again, Shanahan didn't say it, you know, expressly, he didn't say it flat out, but it didn't take, too much reading between the lines to figure out that he's going to have his team uh, jacked up for this game. So, and, and the Niners are so much better than the Redskins anyway that it, 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 I'm going to uh, lay the points. I believe his uh, phrase was, I've put the dysfunction of Washington behind me. So, yeah, it wasn't very flattering. So, New Orleans uh, going to Chicago, the Bears three and a half or three point, three point favorites at home. As Chicago hosting the Saints Bears three-point favorites at Soldier Field. Who do you like in this one? Well, this is another case where I am investing in one side of the football, and that is the Bears defense against the New Orleans offense. Uh, the New Orleans offense with Teddy Two Gloves, Teddy Bridgewater, <laughs> has done a terrific job subbing for the injured Drew Brees. He's 4-0 and as a starter since Brees went down in week two against the Rams. So, yes, I respect Teddy uh, Bridgewater, but I think it's going to be tough for the Saints, who are used to playing in climate control conditions, to come up to uh, Soldier Field and play in the outdoors in, against that defense. So I think Bridgewater will struggle, and as a result, I, I've got the Bears uh, winning by a touchdown. D-Man, we appreciate it. You can see more of his picks, uh, cleveland.com, and uh, we appreciate the, the little sampling here on More Sports and Less Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Dennis Maniloff with the picks. Look for him in the uh, pages of The Plain Dealer and cleveland.com uh, this weekend as well. As always, we appreciate the time, D-Man. We're uh, done for this edition of More Sports and Less Levine, the weekend winner's edition. want to remind you, Legalized sports wagering just a little over an hour away from downtown Cleveland. Presque Isle Casino and Downs right off of I-90 in Erie, Pennsylvania. The Bet America Sportsbook, 50 state-of-the-art kiosks located throughout their casino. Head up there. It's always a good time. I want to remind you also, Les Levine will be back in the chair Monday from 6 to 7. Have a great weekend, and we will see you next week.